with this video that we're doing now, uh, we close the book of Acts. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 28, the last chapter in the book of Acts. And uh, I have to say I really enjoyed uh, my own little study of this chapter. Uh, Acts chapter 28 uh, deals with uh, the final part of Paul's trip to, to Rome, and, and it concludes with him being under house rest in Rome. In fact, the chapter itself can be divided into three parts. Uh, verse 1 to verse 10 uh, deals with their uh, time on the island of Malta. You'll recall that they were shipwrecked, and they landed on the island of Malta just south of Italy. And then <clears throat> verse 11 to verse 16 sort of gives the final leg of the journey to Rome. And uh, there's also another uh, time on board ship and then uh, over land by foot. And then verse 17 to the end of the chapter deals with Paul's time in Rome. He's under a house rest and he's testifying to the Lord Jesus there. And that's how the book of Acts closes. So let's look at the first part here, uh, chapter 28, starting verse 1. Uh, when they escaped, they uh, found out that it was uh, Malta. Malta just uh, south of Sicily. Sicily, of course, just uh, south of the toe on the boot of Italy. And we get uh, verse 2, and uh, the natives, those the people who lived uh, on the island, showed us unusual kindness for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling, because of the cold. Recall now, they're already well into November. Uh, the month of November, and it's chilly. Even there in that part of the world this time of the year was chilly and rainy, and they were cold because uh, they had been in the ocean, they were wet. So the uh, natives there, they built a fire and people started to dry out and warm themselves. Verse 3, we find an incident with Paul. Uh, when he had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper, that was like a snake, uh, came out of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man was a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. And so in their superstitious thinking, uh, they feel that Paul uh, is being uh, receiving divine retribution. <clears throat> he escaped the, the sea rack only to be poisoned by a snake, but that's not what happened. For we see in verse 5 that he shook the creature off to the fire, but suffered no harm. And then they go to the other extreme in verse 6. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. So we sort of went over the board in the other direction. From someone under the divine retribution as a murderer, but now someone who is a god. Verse 7, in that region there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. So Paul's really get an opportunity to... Uh, demonstrate the power of God. But of course, behind such demonstrations in these days of the apostles, when signs and wonders were operating at such a level, that uh, was always the gospel testimony. No doubt he shared the gospel, preached the gospel when he was there, although Luke doesn't really record it. Verse 9, so when this was done, the rest of, on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. Verse 10, they also honored us in many ways. And when we departed, uh, they provided such things uh, as were necessary. And so we find in verse 11, after three months, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship. So they found another ship of the line of the Imperial fleet from Alexandria, another grain ship uh, that the uh, centurion was able to uh, locate and go on board. He could automatically go on board uh, with his prisoners uh, because uh, it belonged to the... Um, to the emperor, the fleet under contract, of course, privately owned, but an under contract to the empire to bring uh, grain from Egypt. And so <clears throat> when the centurion uh, came on board, he would become uh, as an officer uh, of the ship. And so it was no problem for him to do that. We find uh, that the ship's figurehead was the twin brothers. Uh, so you 
on the prow of the ship, they would have these figureheads. The twin brothers, really the sons of Zeus, right? Castor and Pollux uh, in Greek uh, mythology. Um, Luke records these types of little details. And no doubt, uh, part of the reason perhaps here is to show the contrast uh, between the truth of uh, the gospel, of the truth of the living God that was coming into the, uh, into the European world, who up to this point have been totally pagan, and showing the, the, the background, the contrast into which the gospel was coming. And then we find in verse 13, from there we circled around and reached Regum, uh, and after one day the south wind blew, and the next day we came to Putoli. Now this uh, city Putoli is um, actually today the city of Naples, but midway up the coast, 245 miles south of the city of Rome. And so they pulled into uh, what is the Bay of Naples. And it says in verse 14, where we found brethren and were invited to stay with them seven days. It's, it's lovely that the first thing they do when they come to a place, they find brethren. And they stayed there seven days. Again, no doubt uh, to be there on the Lord's day, to remember the Lord Jesus and his death as he has requested us to do. Uh, and that's the pattern of the early Christians was always to remember the Lord Jesus and the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. And that's uh, no doubt what goes on here, although it's not uh, actually spelled out, but we would assume this. Uh, and it's nice to see that we found brethren. Um, they were not part of a, of, a, of a party, a denomination, a sect, a splint group off of the church, or anything like that. None of these things existed at this point. If you were a Christian, you were with the brethren, and that was it. Uh, sometimes it would be lovely if it was like that again, wouldn't it be? If we could just be brethren, and that all the barriers would fall. But those aren't the days we're living in, and I don't think we can go back to that time, unfortunately. And so we find at the end of verse 14, and so we went toward Rome. Now they were on foot. They were heading to Rome. And we find in verse 15, uh, from there, from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as um, the Appi Forum and three inns. These actually are two towns. Okay. And when Paul saw them, he thanked God and he, and he took courage. Okay. Um, it's lovely to see that uh, brothers in Rome had heard about Paul. You know, news travels fast. There was no, there was no uh, messaging, no texting, no Facebook, uh, like we have today where we have instant contact. But nevertheless, words traveled fast that Paul, the great apostle Paul, was on the way to Rome to visit them. And so some of them were so excited about this that they came out from these two towns, which were 40 miles and 30 miles respectively south of Rome uh, to, to, to uh, meet Paul. It's uh, lovely to see that. And um, they, uh, when Paul saw these brethren, he uh, took uh, courage. He, he thanked God. And then we get in verse uh, 16. Now, when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. So the centurion uh, handed uh, the, um, the apostle Paul over. Uh, to a Roman soldier, and no doubt Paul was actually chained to him. That's generally how it's pictured as, as being done, that he would be literally chained to the soldier. Um, and if not that, at least under close guard. Uh, and this soldier was uh, commissioned to care for Paul and to keep an eye on him as well. Now, I should just say, here now, Paul's in Rome. Uh, the year is AD 60. Uh, we should just stop for a sec and um, second take a look at what has Paul written uh, because at this point Paul has already written the Romans uh, that epistle you know that follows the book of Acts we see if we turn the page over we find you know Paul's epistle to the Romans but although it, it is found in our Bible immediately following the book of Acts it was actually already written at this time uh, of AD 60 indeed pre three years previously in AD 57, Paul had written Romans, uh, I think it's, if memory serves me, from uh, the city of Corinth. So the Romans uh, had already gotten Paul's epistle. In fact, um, by this point, Paul had already written all his foundational epistles, what I call his foundational epistles, 
all his pre-prison uh, uh, epistles, the, all the epistles that were written before he was under a arrest. And that would include uh, First and Second Thessalonians, Galatians, First and Second Corinthians, uh, and Romans. And that's the, the general order in which I believe they are written. Although some think Galatians was before First and Th Second Thessalonians, it's hard exactly to determine that. But those were the two earliest epistles: First and Second Thessalonians, Galatians, First and Second Corinthians, and then Romans. And so these epistles had already been written. And the year is now A.D. Uh, 60. And so we move on to the, the second part of the chapter is, uh, is Paul's, uh, or actually the third part of the chapter, Paul's ministry in Rome. Okay, his ministry in Rome. Verse 17 says, and after three days that Paul, it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to them, men and brethren, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they examined me, wanted to let me go, but because there was no cause for putting me to death. But when I, the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. Uh, for this reason, therefore, I have called you to see you and to speak with you because of the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. So Paul basically um, explains to the, not the Jewish Christians, but the, the, the Jewish people dwelling in Rome. Again, Paul wants to bring the gospel to the Jews that are in Rome and also to the Gentiles, which are in Rome, right? And we get that in Romans chapter one, uh, verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and for the Greek, okay? So it's the Jew first and then the Greek, the Gentile. That was Paul's, uh, that was Paul's method. And he states that when he wrote the Romans three years previously. What I like about this is that uh, when Paul arrives in Rome, in verse 17, uh, he doesn't waste any time. He doesn't let any moss grow, you know, on him. Uh, it says after three days, uh, he called the leaders of the Jews together, he just took enough time to 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 set up in his new uh, his new uh, situation. We find that at the end of the chapter, he's in a rented house. He rents out a house, and they probably have to set up house and so on. He takes three days to do that. You know, you think, you know, in our you know first world modern you know world of modernity and you know wealth that we have and our self centeredness and everything. If, if that was us, and we had experienced all the things that Paul had experienced, you know, shipwreck and arrest and standing before leaders and tribunals and so on, uh, we said, well, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to some, have some, um, you know, self-care days. I'm going to have to have a mental health break, you know. Uh, I'm going to take a month off and just, you know, go, you know, have a rest. But that's not Paul, okay? He doesn't waste any time. Of course, um, He's an exceptional person, an exceptional figure, full of energy and zeal uh, for the Lord Jesus. So Paul declares to the Jews in Rome uh, why he is there, why he's under arrest, and that he's innocent. And But really, it's just so he could share the gospel with them. Uh, and, and he's explaining why he's under arrest. That's what he mentions at the end of verse 20. Uh, I, am, uh, I am, for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain probably referring to the chain by which he was chained to the uh, to the uh, Roman soldier. So in verse 21, we get the response of the, the Jews in Rome. Uh, they said to him, we neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you, but we desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. So they say, look, we haven't heard anything about you. Uh, so apparently the charges of the Jews in Jerusalem had never reached the ears uh, of uh, the Jews in Rome. Okay, But what they have heard, they've heard about this sect uh, that's spoken against everywhere. Of course, that's uh, the church, the Christianity, the, the truth of, uh, of the gospel, of the truth of uh, what is called the way. Remember, we found earlier that the early Christians were called the people of the way. And the Jewish people hear that Paul's 
uh, speaking to, um, said that it's spoken against everywhere. So we want to hear more about that. So that's Paul's open door, right, to share the gospel with these guys. So uh, verse 23, so when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, uh, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets, from morning till evening. So Paul's declaring to them the things of the kingdom of God, right? And the, the th all the things written in the law and the Moses concerning Jesus. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. It's all about Jesus and the law and the prophets. And we could add to that the Psalms uh, all declare him prophetically. And so Paul, from morning to evening, was uh, reasoning and preaching to these men in his rented house, declaring to them uh, these things. And then we find in verse 24, And some were persuaded by these things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. And that's always the response. You know, some will uh, accept it and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, receive that testimony, and others uh, will reject it. And, and the, the word that's used here to describe the rejection is quite strong. In my translation, which is the New King James, it says some disbelieved. The New American Standard has some would not believe. Okay, The, the, the word in the Greek is, is literally uh, against belief, you know, pisteo, uh, against faith, against belief. Uh, they would not believe. It's like an act of the will. And then uh, Paul quotes uh, uh, the, from the prophet Isaiah. Um, it says, in verse 25, So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed. After Paul had said one word, you know, Paul, Paul sort of gave them a blast of the shotgun here. Um, the Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah, the prophets, to our fathers, saying, and he quotes Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9. And so we'll just read it. Go to this people and say, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts. So that I should uh, heal them. So this is a prophecy, as I said, from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9. And it's a prophecy of judicial blindness, of unbelief uh, upon uh, the people of Israel. And this is quoted several times throughout the New Testament, this prophecy. It was a long time coming. It was written 700 years before Christ came. But we see the Lord Jesus quotes it in Matthew 13 when he preached on the, uh, the parables of the mysteries of the kingdom of the heavens. And then we find the Apostle John quotes it in John chapter 12 because of the unbelief of the people, you know, that their eyes were blind, that they couldn't see the Lord Jesus. And in John chapter 12, you'll find it quoted. And it's also quoted in the book of Romans chapter 11, where Paul describes the fact that judicial blindness has fallen upon the people of Israel. And it says for a season, like for a season, it's not permanent. Uh, God will remove that veil eventually from the eyes of the people of Israel. And then we, and then the, we have the quotation, quotation here from Paul to the uh, Jewish, uh, his Jewish listeners, which is actually the last quotation of it in the New Testament as far as a historical chronological point of view. Uh, as I say, Romans, although the book follows uh, the book of Acts in our Bibles, the book of Romans actually was written uh, before uh, the book of Acts and uh, three years before the events found here in the book of Acts, I should say. And, um, and so technically, uh, these words of Paul in uh, verses 26 and 27 are the last time these words are uttered in relation to uh, the people of Israel. So that blindness continues. But, you know, as I said, this is now AD 60. Uh, that's the year we're looking at here as these events that we're reading about. Ten years later, uh, the temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was flattened by the Romans in AD 70. And the Jews were dispersed. The temple was totally wiped out. Only 10 years after these words, uh, that was accomplished. And so we see things are coming to a head, right, for the people of Israel in connection with reception of their Messiah. 
So we continue on, uh, verse uh, 28. Therefore, let it be known to you that salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. Okay, and that's how it's been for the last 2,000 years. The gospel continues to go out amongst the Gentile nations, and many thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, yea, even millions have been brought to know the Lord Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior from amongst the nations. That work is still going on. And then we get <clears throat> um, verse 29, And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great dispute amongst themselves. So they were arguing amongst themselves about Paul's doctrine, about the, the message of the gospel. And then we get the, the concluding verses of Acts 20. And then Paul dwelt two whole years. Okay, we know that he was the start of the AD 60 when he arrived in Rome. And two whole years in his own rented house, he received all who came to him preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern Jesus Christ with all confidence and no one forbidding him. Or as the Darby translation has it, uh, with all confidence and, uh, and uh, unhinderedly, that he continued doing this unhinderedly, without hindrance, for two whole years. So the, the sort of the history of this, so Paul's in this um, under house arrest uh, for two years, preaching the gospel every day as much as he could. It was during this period, this two-year period, uh, that he wrote his so-called prison epistles, which were really his house arrest prisons, uh, epistles, not his prison epistles, his house arrest epistles, although we call them his prison epistles. And what he, the, the epistles that he wrote during uh, these two years are Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. And then he was released, okay? And... Uh, between 62 and 65 AD, there was a three-year period, and Paul was released, and we don't have any record of that. We don't know what he did. Uh, perhaps he went to Spain. There may, his plan was originally to go to Spain. I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. Uh, and then he was arrested again, and then AD 66, arrested, and then he was put in an actual prison in Rome. The uh, Mamertine prison, which is a prison for criminals and a prison for those who were, you know, crimes against the state and that type of thing. He would stand before Caesar and he was martyred in the year of AD, AD 67, 68. Okay. Uh, Peter was too around the same period, martyred by Nero. So we don't know what happened in between that time. But we know when he was in the his final uh, prison period, uh, he wrote, the, the second epistle to Timothy. I should say that during that time of freedom uh, between AD 62 and 65, he did write uh, two epistles. He wrote First Timothy and he wrote Titus. But what I mean is I, we don't really know where he went or what he did. But he did write Titus. He did write First Timothy. And then in his final actual imprisonment, he writes the second epistle to Timothy. And there he alludes to his his impending martyrdom. And that really comes out in chapters 1 and, and chapter 4 of the second epistle of Timothy. Now, Paul had a desire to go to Spain via Rome. His original plan was to go to Rome and then and then from there go to Spain. And, and church history, church tradition says he did actually go to Spain during that three-year period between the two arrests, between his house imprisonment and then the final imprisonment uh, in the actual prison in Rome when he wrote his last epistle. So we'll just look at a, at a couple of um, passages to show that. If you want to turn to, to Romans uh, uh, chapter 1, uh, just flip over a page to Romans chapter 1, and we look at verse uh, 10, Romans chapter 1, verse 10. And Paul, when he's writing three years previous to his house arrest, he's writing the Romans, and he says, making request if by some means, uh, he's speaking of his prayers here, now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. you know, he had never seen the Romans face to face. He knew some of them uh, from different occasions, but he had never been to the, to the assembly in Rome, and there were many there he had not seen face to face, although some of them he knew personally also. Verse 11, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, um, both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, 
that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you, just as among the other Gentiles. So he had a desire to go to Rome. But when we come to uh, chapter 15, we get some more details. Uh, turn over to chapter 15 and verse 22. His plan to, to visit Rome. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you, but now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire of these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey. So his idea was uh, on his way to Spain, he would stop in Rome and see them there. Uh, now he was in Corinth, he was in Greece, he was collecting money for the poor saints in Jerusalem. We've already studied that in the book of Acts. Uh, see in verse 25, but now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. And so he did, he went up to Jerusalem. For it had been pleased uh, from, uh, by those from Macedonia and Achaia, that is northern and southern Greece, to make a certain contribution for the poor saints who are, uh, who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty also is to minister to them, minister them in material things. So the Gentile Christians got a gift together to give the poor saints in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Therefore, when I have performed this, and seal to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. This is Paul's plan. After he was to bring the gift to Jerusalem, and then he would come to Rome, and then uh, visit those in Rome, and then from there he would go to Spain. And so he asked for their prayers in verse 30. Now I beg, beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe that my service uh, for the saints should be acceptable. And then I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And so this prayer was answered. It was answered partially uh, and answered fully, just not the way Paul expected, but ans answered partially from what he desired and what he expected. Um, he was delivered from those in Judea in the sense that they would have killed him, and the Romans intervened, and remember, on the step, temple steps, and so he, he was spared death at their hands, okay, and he did come to Rome, but he came to Rome courtesy of the Roman government on one of, on the imperial fleet, the grain fleet, the ships from the Alexandria, and um, under the care and watchful eye of Roman, uh, of the Roman uh, centurion, so so the prayer was answered, and so now he's in Rome. And so many have assumed that in that period of freedom uh, between his uh, first imprisonment, his house arrest that we're reading in chapter 28, and then the, 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 that three-year uh, period of freedom before he was arrested again and then martyred during that time, it's believed that he, he was able to go to Spain. We can't prove that absolutely. So let's just come back. We'll close off. Uh, chapter uh, 28 here. Um, so I just want to be clear on the the writing of Paul's epistles. I just want to go over that one more time. I don't know if I was that clear as to the time frame. We'll run by that one more time, then I'll have a little closing word here. So uh, in, previous to AD 60, previous to the events recorded here uh, that we have in chapter 28, Paul wrote his foundational epistles, okay? First and Second Thessalonians, Galatians, First and Second Corinthians, and Romans. Then now, uh, between sixty and sixty-two A.D., under house arrest, he writes Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. Then he is free for three years. Again, could have gone to Spain. We don't know, but during that time, he wrote First Timothy and Titus. Then he was rearrested. It was to stand before Caesar on trial, and he wrote Second Timothy during that period, and then came his martyrdom, okay? But I love this uh, concluding, it's sort of, a, the the book of Acts sort of ends sort of abruptly, but it says that Paul was continuing unhinderedly. He was not hindered, even though he was under arrest of sorts, but God's word is not hindered. And Paul speaks about this in Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter two, and this is in reference, of course, to his final arrest, a, a more solemn and serious arrest, if you can put it that way, 
uh, his, his conditions were much more severe. Okay, uh, so Second Timothy chapter two and verse nine, and Paul says there, uh, "For which I suffer trouble." That is for the gospel. I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even to the point of chains. But notice he says this: "But the word of God is not chained." Okay, the word of God is not chained, and I've sort of have apl applied this to uh, our own situation. You know, as I've recorded these videos were during the pandemic, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, started in 2020. Now we're in, as I record this in the year 2022, I don't want to date these videos because may, they may outlast me, right? But just to give you like the context and, and, and sort of an application. And some of us have been, a little getting impatient and you know sort of chomping at the bit and complaining a little bit you know uh, uh, restrictions in the assemblies and and restriction in traveling and and it's cumbersome you know and and you know but the thing is let's remember this is the thing we have to remember okay god is sovereign and god's word is not hindered okay god's word is not hindered and a final little thought in connection that we have here, we find in Philippians uh, chapter 1, verse 13, you know, when Paul was under this house arrest that we're reading of in Acts uh, chapter 28, he wrote this in uh, Philippians 1, verse 13, so that it's become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. What Paul's saying there is that uh, he's leaving a great impression upon the Romans, even the whole, you know, upper echelon of the Roman government and society during this two-year period of his house arrest. He had a great impact, right? Even though he was in chains, but his, that his chains were in Christ. He was making Christ known. And, you know, the Lord told Paul when he got converted that he would witness and testify before kings and great men and bear witness of him to the Gentiles. And finally, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 22, we see we actually see the impact there. Of Philippians chapter 4, verse 22, uh, Paul says, um, all, uh, all the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. Well, that may not have been Caesar's immediate family necessarily. There may be some, but uh, the, the, his, his, his close administration, you know, those connected with his house. So that's amazing the impact that Paul had. So the word of God is not hindered. Paul continued unhinderedly. And the gospel is still going out unhinderedly. And so we don't have to get nervous. We don't have to, you know, panic. You know, when things don't seem to be working out and there's hindrances and so on. God's in control. And the word of God is not bound. The word of God is not in chains. Well, may the Lord encourage you as you... Uh, uh, Go over this chapter yourselves and study it. And I'm sure that you'll get even more out of it than I did. But I certainly enjoyed it and was encouraged by it. May the Lord bless you. Until next time. Amen.